Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I would like to thank the Asia Society for having me here today. Thank you, Ambassador Shirin and Professor Robin for um, you. And thank you for continually providing a platform for Afghans that includes President Ashraf Ghani, as you mentioned, Ambassador. And I should also point out that this year, the Afghan robotics teams, which, was, which were, came to Washington when I was the ambassador there, um, were the winners of the um, Asia Society's Game Changer Award. Ambassador Adil Araz, um, it's a pleasure to be here when you've taken over. It's, a, it's an honor to have to see our first female PR uh, at the UN. And um, uh, Deputy Minister Marjan Mateen, um, it seems like we have a lot of women delegation here. Um, we are outnumbered, which is great. I certainly cannot compete with the Afghan girls' robotics team. You know, If anyone here has met them, and I hope you have, um, you may have met the team's cap captain, Fatima Khadrian. You will know what I mean. She is remarkable. You know, when she speaks, it's as if it's poetry that's coming out of her mouth. And it's fitting that I mention that the Afghan girls robotics team in Ms. Kadrian, because today I want to talk primarily about people. About the Afghan people. Because their beliefs, their perseverance, their struggle, and why these intangible, unqualifiable characteristics matter for our security, stability, and our prospects for peace. I know from my time as ambassador in Washington that when Afghanistan is discussed in the halls of U.S. government, academia, in think tanks, and in the media, it's usually a debate that revolves around numbers. The numbers are important, and I will talk about them today. But our people are our main asset, and I believe the transformation we have undergone as a society over the past 18 years has hard policy implications that must be considered as we move toward peace. Last month, Afghanistan observed our Armed Forces Day. I witnessed the promotion ceremony of several young soldiers that day at our Ministry of Defense. One was Captain Mursal Afshar a young woman who marched proudly and confidently across the stage to accept her promotion from first lieutenant to a captain. I was deeply impressed by her professionalism, dedication, and patriotism. She impressed and represent many of the young men and women who are defending our sovereignty and who are fighting on the front lines of the global war. The vigor and enthusiasm I saw in Captain Afshar wasn't ceremonial. I've also heard it in the poetic speeches of wounded soldiers that I visited in hospitals. Many of our soldiers and policemen get wounded two to three to four times, and yet they return to the battlefield. I read detailed security briefings every day but was struck by one account of a check post of soldiers at a far-flung outpost who were surrounded by the Taliban. They chose to fight to the death instead of surrender, despite the advice of their ground officer. No one survived. Despite suffering, 80% of our human losses in the past five years since the ANDSF assumed full responsibility for security in 2014. Recruitment for our security forces is at a record high. Why is this? Our forces fight because we believe in what we are fighting for, and we know its value. It's worth our life. It's the, re the same reason young Fatima Kadarian carries on with her dream to build a tech university in Afghanistan, despite the fact that her own father was martyred in a Daesh attack in Herat. 
I see our security forces up close each and every day. They are a microcosm for the wider transformation that has taken place across the country, both rural and urban. They embody the new Afghanistan. We believe in democracy, the Afghan constitution, and the state institutions in human and civil rights that it upholds. We believe in progress, equality, tolerance, education, and true Islamic values. We're proud of our nation and our state, and we're willing to sacrifice a great deal to safeguard it and what we have worked to build over these past 18 years. So what are the policy implications for this new Afghanistan, for both the Afghan government and for our international partners? First of all, elections are the expectations of the Afghan people. They are also connected to the success of the peace process. If the pattern of de democratic succession which has taken root in Afghanistan over the past 18 years, is disrupted or denied, even for the sake of peace. We will undermine the democracy we have all invested in dearly. We will betray the trust that the Afghan people have placed in democracy as a system of governance. Second, for peace to be sustainable in Afghanistan, we have to base it on the demands of the Afghan people. Over the past year, Afghans have risen their voices and organized for peace. The Helmand peace marchers who started marching last year and are still marching across the country. A gathering of 2,500 young men and women from all 34 provinces in Kabul in December last year. A gathering of 3,500 women who met in Kabul in the Loe Jirga tent last month to raise the voices of 15,000 women from all 34 provinces. What are they asking for? Perspectives and experiences with war and peace vary. So ideas about what are acceptable, costs for peace also vary. But their main demand is to be represented. Afghans want an inclusive peace process which will result in a sustainable peace, a process that takes place between Afghans and not a deal between elites configured behind closed doors under pressured timelines. I hope this gives you some perspective on the emotional state of the Afghan people right now and now for Washington's favorite, now the numbers. As we pursue peace, we will continue to maintain military and counterterrorism objectives. Patriotism and courage alone do not sustain a fighting force. We implemented an, an overhaul of the security sector over the past five years, which allowed us to bring in desperately needed new leadership and management. We're working on doubling our commando force and tripling the still nascent Afghan Air Force. We're working with the World Bank on an assessment that will allow us to plan to sustain and maintain the ANDSF financially within the next four to five years. But to develop, upgrade, and equip our forces we, with modern technology and capabilities, we will continue to rely on our international partners until 2030. The October 2018 parliamentary elections revealed mismanagement in administrative disorganization in the Independent Election Commission and the Independent Elections Complaint Commission. Four million Afghans risked their lives to cast, cast their ballots. 35% of them were women. They deserve much better for the presidential election in July this year. After reforms were made to the electoral law last month, all of the presidential candidates voted on a new commissioners and heads of the IEC in ECC, adding an unprecedented level of credibility and accountability to the leadership. I'll add as well that two newly elected heads of uh, the commissions are both women, another first for Afghanistan. Lastly, for peace, Afghanistan will continue to pursue a sequential, thoughtful, 
peace process, which leads to dialogue between Afghan government and people and the Taliban. Since February 2018, the National Unity Government has done the following towards peace. We made an unconditional offer for peace talks to the Taliban, announced a successful ceasefire, brought the Afghan ulama in the Islamic world together to denounce terrorism and extremism, announced a negotiating team and prepared a phased roadmap for peace, and facilitated public consensus building gatherings and meetings with diverse groups of Afghan men and women and youth. Next month, we will hold the National Consultative Lawyer Jirga, or Grand Council, to solidify national consensus on the costs of peace. We believe a legitimate and sustainable peace deal with the Taliban can be expected in 2019. I'd like to end now with a message for the Taliban and their roughly 40,000 foot soldiers operating on Afghan soil. This message comes from the nearly 1 million civil servants and government employees upholding the Afghan democratic state built through the sacrifices of thousands of Afghan security forces and civil civilians over the past 18 years. The Afghan people and government are ready for peace and are ready to engage directly to put an end to the violence. Now it's up to the Taliban to make a move toward peace. We will believe it when we see it. Until that time, we will fight as we always have for what we believe in and for what is ours. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mahib, for that inspiring speech. And I'll personally say welcome to uh, Ambassador Adela Ross, whom I haven't seen since she graduated from the Fletcher School. Um, well, you spoke about Afghanistan and its people, Mahib. Uh, but we're in the United States, and uh, which you didn't speak about very much. So I, I'm, I would like to ask you, some things about that. I'm speaking about that in Washington, so I left that part. <laughs> okay, well, in Washington, that is all that they will be interested in hearing. We were interested in the other part of your talk, too. Um, but uh, as you know, the, re the, the reason you mentioned the uh, hurried nature of the peace talks, uh, and I think we all recognize that that is not, well, I can't speak for anyone. I recognize that that is not the ideal way to have a peace process. But I think we know why it's being conducted that way. And the reason it's being conducted that way is because of the impatience of President Trump to get out of Afghanistan, which he has signaled r repeatedly. Um, and in fact, as you know, there was a leak to the press that he had instructed his national security advisor to start the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan, which hasn't been done yet, of course, as you say. But nonetheless, uh, he's made it pretty clear that he wants to get out, and the signals seem to be that, that that's the reason for the rush, you know, so that to get something in place before he loses his patience with the whole with the whole thing. So I just wondered if you could say how uh, you and your government respond to this apparent, although unclear, change in the nature of the American engagement with Afghanistan. Well, Professor Robin, it's always a pleasure. And uh, you know, you're, we can count on you to ask the tough questions to begin with that. But let me say that the United States and Afghanistan's relations are based on the strategic partnership agreement and a bilateral security agreement. If the United States would like to withdraw from Afghanistan, there are provisions within the bilateral security agreement. You don't need to negotiate with the Taliban to do that. If the negotiations with the Taliban are to bring peace, we must then take into account what the Afghan people want and what we are prepared to have peace with before we have an understanding of the costs the Afghans are prepared to pay for peace. You cannot negotiate. On what grounds? Right now, everybody thinks peace is ceasefire which means everything remains in place, a status quo, if, if peace was to come, which means 
we continue to operate, our institutions continue to operate in that way. But you know that's not true. The Taliban would want something. Right? They want to change, bring changes to the constitution. They may want to bring other changes. We don't know what the Taliban want. They haven't told us yet. They don't want to talk to the Afghan government. But there will have to be compromises. And if there is no consensus on what those compromises are and whether the Afghans are prepared to pay those, the, that price, there will be no peace. So the entire effort is futile before the Afghan people are consulted. So it depends on what you want to achieve. I hope that answers your question. Well, let me follow up. Uh, you said you don't know what the Taliban want. I think we all know what the Taliban want. They've said it thousands of times. They want the complete withdrawal of foreign troops from Afghanistan. They haven't said clearly what kind of government they want in Afghanistan after that takes place. I think we know but, it. But they, but they have not said, well, you just said you didn't know. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but you, but no, they, in they terms of what kind of government, we know what kind of government they but want. But they, they haven't said, and of course, the United States, why is the United States negotiating with the Taliban? Well, the main reason... The United States went into Afghanistan, of course, was because of the uh, question of terrorism. And that seems to be, from what we can tell from outside, the main item uh, on the agenda. So I'll just ask, so from your point of view, you are, you are portraying the conflict as a kind of internal conflict between, well, of course, you don't mean, that, mean it that way. I don't want to put words in your mouth. But you're talking about the Afghan aspect of the conflict between the Taliban, the Afghan government, and people. Um, on the other hand, there are these international aspects as well. Um, and well, I'll just ask you one more time, and then I won't press you again. Uh, how do you plan to adjust to the prospect of, of course, the U.S. troops leaving? Uh, how will, will that change uh, the balance of forces? How will you address uh, the needs of your security forces? And what is the message, if, if they do leave, and what is your message to the United States about uh, the apparent war re weariness of uh, the Americans. I can't compare that to the war weariness of Afghans, but what passes for war weariness in the United States, you know, after uh, the 17 years? Well, first of all, um, you said the reason the United States would have to negotiate with the Taliban is because they're worried about Taliban's connection to terrorist groups and, and what um, they will. Um, I, I think it's pretty clear that the Taliban cannot be separated from, from that core. It's in their DNA. Uh, that's where they come from. And if they were to separate, to part ways with terrorist elements and, and call that publicly, there will be no Taliban left. Uh, there is, that is part of their ideology. Um, so to, um, to, to count on that, again, if that is the objective, um, it's, it's not one that would be achievable. The other is whether this is an internal or an international conflict, you know that it's not an internal conflict. If this was an internal conflict, just an insurgency, we would finish it every year. But every year they get reinforcements, uh, they get equipment. Just in the last two months we have um, uh, captured uh, um, uh, close to 30 tons of explosives coming through into Afghanistan from I know you, you know where. <laughs> and you know that amount of explosives are not readily available in supermarkets that you can buy. Yeah? So I think we know where the conflict is and how um, and what is behind it. But we're not talking about that part. If this is about peace with the Taliban, we're talking about what are um, the models uh, and how should we be negotiating where there would be at least uh, a, a, you know, a light at the end of the tunnel. The, the process is the important part. Uh, goals, targeted objectives that we would like to set and then try to achieve it and see whether the path we choose will actually get us to, to that uh, objective or not. It's obviously not to end the reasons for the conflict. The reasons for the conflict are not in Afghanistan. It's to end or find a way uh, to, um, uh, to bring the Taliban to the negotiating table to eliminate perhaps the legitimacy that the Taliban give themselves uh, to fight a war. That is perhaps all we can take, but there will still be 
uh, a large number of uh, irreconcilables that will continue to be the uh, to, to continue to, you know to uh, to try to achieve the same objectives that the Taliban currently try to and we would have to fight them uh, I'll, I'll come back to the uh, region in a minute that's part of my, mm -hmm. my my plan so we will get we will get to that very important question but you said that terrorism correct me if I'm mis misstating what you said is in the DNA of the Taliban but you also said that you have a plan for peace, and in fact, your government has said there's no higher priority mm -hmm. than peace. So, how will you make how what is your, how do you reconcile those two statements that you want to make peace with a group who are inseparable from terrorism? Absolutely, we think the South Asia strategy was actually a game changer. It is something that the Afghans had wanted for a long time. It addressed most of what we you know, how we think we would w arrive at peace. It's not just the pressure, military pressure on the Taliban in Afghanistan and all the other terrorist groups. It also addressed the regional component of, of uh, what, you know, in their associations, funding um, uh, sanctuaries and safe havens. And, and that is, that was the path to peace, and that is still our path to peace. We have to engage the region. We also have to engage and continue the military pressure on the non-reconcilable elements of, you know, of the Taliban. There are, there are those who want peace among the Taliban ranks. But we have to, uh, we have to understand that the, that's not everybody. And to only focus on the Taliban alone and, and wish um, that, uh, that that would bring peace to Afghanistan, I think, is, um, is futile. Well, of course. Be a, a peace process will be multi-layered and includes uh, both the domestic issues and the international issues. And I'm, I'm not exactly satisfied you answered my question, but I have a feeling if I ask it again, I won't get a, a different answer. So let me turn to. Uh, I tried to answer <laughs> as much as I could. You know? <laughs> so I will. Uh, I'll turn to back to the question of the region in Pakistan. The re and in the region, there are multiple issues. Uh, of course, but I just published an article about it this morning. Mm -hmm. that you probably haven't had a chance to see it in foreign policy. Um, but let's start with, with the country that you did not mention, uh, Pakistan. Um, uh, recently, Pakistan has been under tr uh, a lot of economic pressure because of its balance of payments problem. They uh, let Mullah Brother out of detention after nine years when uh, it's widely believed that he was held in detention because he was reaching out to the Afghan government and have allowed him to go to Doha to lead the negotiations on the Taliban side, though they have kept his family in Pakistan, of course, unlike some of the other uh, Taliban leaders who have gone to his Doha. His son is with him. Oh, okay. His son is with him. Yeah, and his son is reputed, as far as I know, to be a very important military leader in, in southern Afghanistan. But I'm not sure about that. Anyway, sure. but so uh, how would you... Uh, what, what's your latest estimate uh, of the degree of cooperation that you are getting from Pakistan? Uh, what has changed? What hasn't changed? What do you still want? We haven't seen any cooperation from Pakistan. Um, the important aspect of, um, of anything with Pakistan beyond spoken words is any agreements that, um, that, that we... Um, try to come around to every year in the winter and then in the summer the fighting season begins so the whole talks about talks and but we uh, I think both countries and our diplomats spend a, a, a large amount of time negotiating an agreement and putting on paper what the issues were between and what what we needed to do to address them the um, uh, it, it's a long uh, acronym, APAPS. Uh, it, it's for Afghanistan, Pakistan, solidarity, you know, peace and uh, I, I, action, action plan, plan for peace and uh, solidarity. It's a it's a long name. It's been so long we have forgotten what it stands for, <laughs> because it didn't get implemented. It stayed on paper, and our main request was let's put an action plan. Now this action plan is in place. Let's start to implement it. There hasn't been any action, and there is no interest from Pakistan to implement that. There is no cooperation with Afghanistan in any aspect. We have diversified our trade from Pakistan. It you, from what, if if it, we had we not done that, this year with drought um, in in uh, the. Uh, the prices of food items would have gone, would have skyrocketed. 
but it doesn't. Pakistan used to close um, the the gates at Torham and Spinboldak whenever they wanted. They want to put you know, uh, restrictions on what we wanted, what we could import. Uh, we have diversified from that into um, uh, our northern route, so to but through Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan now. Um, and through uh, Iran by Chabahar connecting to India, the air corridors. It, it has opened up opportunities for Afghanistan not only to increase our trade, uh, but also to, um, uh, to give us more options for import. And we had to do that. The, the easiest, the cheapest way would have been through Pakistan, but we'd never see any progress on action. And so until we see, until we see willingness to make um, action, we are not going to buy any more words from Pakistan on what they uh, are and willing to say. They're always very nice. They, they, they speak about brotherhood, um, you know, uh, historical linkages and, and, and the likes, but then all we see is uh, terrorists coming our way and no brotherhood. Um, you said that the South Asia strategy was what you were looking for, and you, mm -hmm. uh, I, I gather you were mainly talking about the part of it relating to uh, increased pressure on Pakistan, because that is what you then started talking about. But now the South Asia strategy has been in place, and you're saying that nothing has changed. What are your? What would you uh, ask the United States to do that it hasn't done? How do you evaluate the Amer America's implementation of the South Asia strategy? I think we've got to give the South Asia strategy more time. The South Asia strategy took into account all of the United States, um, you know, institutional capabilities. It was to increase the military pressure on the Taliban, and we have. We're hearing Taliban are not, their leadership is leaving Afghanistan as much as they, you know, they can, because they know they can no longer uh, walk around Afghanistan freely. They are being targeted, and, and so there is pressure on the Taliban. Even now, there is pressure, that military pressure. What we have to remember while there is this discussion going on, so what, is, what remains status quo is still the South Asia strategy, at least when it comes to mili uh, the military pressure part of it. Um, and then there were the regional components of it. Yes, there was the part that would put pressure on Pakistan to um, part ways with, um, uh, with the safe heavens and, and put pressure on the Taliban and end uh, sanctuaries and providing support, military and other financial support to the Taliban. Um, but there were also other components of that, and that was um, how do we uh, bring consensus in the region for peace. It included India, and it also included the rest of the region. You, you, know, you have to remember that the United States gave exemptions for Chabahar port, um, you know, for Iran. That is one of the only exceptions it has received. Um, because it wanted to, you know, promote peace and reconciliation in the region and um, uh, and create an environment where we could we could go to true peace, you know, we could go to true reconciliation. Um, so we still believe that that is the right approach to take. Um, uh, the South Asia strategy also included uh, an expedited, you know, training uh, and and. Uh, uh, um, of the Afghan security forces, which is also happening. We are doubling the number of our um, uh, commando force. They're doing a great job. Last year was one of the toughest we went through. Uh, we also implemented a number of reforms as part of our four-year security plan, uh, where we retired many of the um, you know, very capable generals who had served but were tired and needed to be bring needed uh, to be replaced with some new and uh, uh, energetic leadership and we have done all of that and we continue to do it yes as i speak there are changes in the security sector again at the operational level we are we are changing the way we fight um, this is if we are to deal with it as the insurgency part of it we have to we have to um, uh, have the afghan ownership and that is also uh, being brought into the policy part, but I am—I um, you know, would stop here because I think moving away from the question you asked, what I will end with is to say that the South Asia strategy has all the components for success, and we think we should continue. That would be our advice: that we should continue what we started 
last year with the um, and and, um, uh, and and see it through. We are close to uh, seeing that success happen. And I, I, I will. I know you what you are going to say. So let me address this first. This is not the U.S.'s longest war. The United States is not fighting in Afghanistan right now. Where the Afghans are doing the fighting part. So it's not the U.S.'s war. The U.S. is there to provide support and assistance to the Afghan security forces. So um, I, I think to characterize it as an, an American war is perhaps disservice to um, the sacrifices that the Afghan security forces are making on your behalf and on our behalf. Well, it certainly is mm -hmm. not mainly an American war, and also the American part of it is still much less than half of the length of the entire war, which started, I believe, before you were born. Absolutely. Uh, uh, in 19, Unfortunately. <laughs> in 1978, so you have never mm -hmm. lived in a country at peace. Um, but actually, I wasn't going to say that. If I was going to say anything, I, don't, I, I would have said, you said you need time, but indications are is that the President is not inclined to grant you that. But at any rate, we don't need to talk about, you can comment on that if you want, but let's move to something different, which you started, which I think is very significant. It's not often, uh, it doesn't get enough attention here, which is, of course, Afghanistan is landlocked. Landlocked countries in general have greater economic difficulties in other countries. They don't have access to the high seas. They don't have control over their own commerce. Uh, they, Afghanistan, besides being landlocked, also has no navigable rivers and other obstacles to, and mountains and deserts and so on, other obstacles to economic development. Um, and it was developed in a way uh, to, be de to be dependent on, at the time it wasn't Pakistan, but on South Asia for its outlet to the sea at the time of the British Empire. And it seems to me that in the last five years, you've done a remarkable amount of work as you started to refer to, uh, in diversifying um, Afghanistan's trading uh, and investment partners uh, in the region and globally. So I wondered, is that something that I think uh, many people are not aware of? If you could just say a few more words about that than what you've already well, said. Well, the country opened other corridors to through, um, uh, uh, through Turkmenistan, what we call the Lapis Lazuli corridor that goes through to, to Europe through Turkmenistan. Um, uh, of course, um, uh, th there is a rail link all the way to China through Uzbekistan again. Um, we, ha we also are investing in, uh, in, in a rail link connectivity with Iran um, that goes to Chabahar port. We opened several air corridors. And I know w when it was opened, people didn't really uh, understand what it was, but it has um, it has now improved all our exports to areas we were, we were, it was hard for us to reach. For example, with India, we keep opening new corridors to different cities um, uh, where our farmers have direct access to, uh, uh, to export their fruit and vegetables. That's one big part of the, the timing of the export is extremely important. Um, our neighbor would usually close the doors around the time uh, of the harvest season, and that uh, that would mean that our uh, our produce would um, would devalue. Of course, uh, they, they only have a short um, lifespan. Um, so it has now opened quite a few opportunities for Afghanistan to export its produce. For example, we didn't know that we were the largest exporter or producer of pine nuts in the world. Um, and because it was exported and then repackaged and then re-exported. Now, um, in, in the last, uh, we opened a corridor with China, who is the, bu the biggest buyer uh, of pine nuts from Afghanistan. Um, the prices of pine nuts have skyrocketed in Kabul. You can't find it anymore. It all goes to China, and it goes directly. And the, the profit margins have gone by hundredfold, because now it is processed in Afghanistan, it is exported directly, and it is um, uh, the, the, the additional value, the $600 million that used to be put on uh, by uh, other, by re-exporters, is now going directly to, uh, to, to the Afghan producers. Um, but we are also, we have also implemented a lot of reforms to increase our revenue collection from customs and taxes. So. Just to give you um, uh, an idea of what that means, we've increased our revenue by 91% in the last four years. But we only collect 35% of our real revenue. 
Uh, so there is still 65% of revenue left. What we collect now is about $2.5 billion. Right? That is not enough to sustain uh, a security force. If I just clarify if, what you mean by when you say you don't collect all the revenue, you mean we the revenue that is only, you collect 35% of the revenue that is due actually comes to Afghan. Yeah. Most of it goes through leakages. I'll call it leakages because mm -hmm. there are several. Some goes through corruption, others is not in the, you know, um, people benefit from it. Mm -hmm. you know? Some of the people who benefit from it then threaten the government with it. Uh, the, it, but that is that's that's mines the illegal mining that happens in Afghanistan. That's also the um, uh, the customs and taxes, and and we have a plan to 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 close that gap. We have already closed. We have gone from 15 percent to 35 percent, and we hope to be able to close the other gap, which would mean our re revenue reaching close to about $6 billion. That's enough to be able to not only pay for our, um, our civilian administration, but also the security institutions. Now, what we are threatened by is, in Afghanistan, the biggest threat is not the Taliban. The biggest threat is actually economical. So if, if the international support to our security forces was to, to stop, that's when it becomes an issue. Nobody says that the ANDSF is not willing to fight. Nobody says that the Afghan government will collapse if, if the U.S. Would, 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 would withdraw. We can sustain the fight. What we are not able to sustain is the economical support to it. Should we be able to guarantee that part of it? You know, nothing, no amount of insurgency will be able to take Kabul. Okay, now let me uh, th thank you. That's very helpful. I was going to ask you about the revenue as well, but you uh, you covered that very well. So those are the addressing some of the real structural historical problems of the Afghan state, which any government would have to address. Um, let's go back to the peace process and the the nature and the inter-Afghan dialogue, both uh, the inclusivity, which you said is necessary, uh, which I assume everyone everyone here agrees with, and how it's uh, it's going to be structured. Um, the, uh, how should I say, well, there is a concrete proposal now for coming out of the people who went to Moscow, but rather, rather than asking you about that, let me ask, put it to you this way. Um, I have noticed, I have been, it's actually quite impressive, the degree to which the start of the peace talks in Doha has stimulated uh, social activism in Afghanistan in what seems to me an almost unprecedented way. And some people might view it as agitation against the peace process. I see it as part of the peace process, actually. Uh, and uh, part of it is being mobilized by the government, uh, but, but, part, part, but much of it, is, is it seems to be spontaneous uh, through the media and so on. Now, um, how, on the other hand, you, when, you, when the government talks about Afghan leadership, it often seems to mean Afghan government leadership, and you emphasize the importance of the Taliban meeting with the Afghan government, which they don't recognize as, as a government. Um, how, uh, as, and some have argued that there's a, a, something of a contradiction between insisting on the government leadership and inclusivity. What is your plan for reconciling those in the peace process? Well, first of all, about the Afghan leadership, the Afghan government is mandated by the Constitution to be in charge of war and peace. I mean, just like any other government would be. It's in our Constitution that the, the government um, is in charge of peace, one. The other is, of course, the Taliban would want to talk to not the government where they have 40 different voices sitting around the table and, and the, on, the only consolidated vi voice being Taliban. The government is the only place where you can get all of the voices unified. There is one unified voice coming out of. And, and this, is, this is not a one-party uh, government uh, or, or not one of those dictatorial republics. This is a true democracy. And the Afghan, the current national unity government represents 100% of the uh, the vote banks that voted for 
uh, for the government. I mean, both both uh, CEO Abdullah and President Ghani formed the National Unity Government, making up all of the electorate. So it's not. It's not a government that is not represented by the people. So when people make a comment that it needs to be inclusive, I think the inclusivity should be focused on other areas. There is enough inclusivity in the government. What we need to include is civil society. What we need to include is media. Uh, what we need to include is the victims of the war. You know, They need a voice. Um, what we need to include is women groups uh, outside, civil society activists of this sort. So, we are all for an inclusive team. It has to be Afghan government-led and owned yeah. for, for the sake of a strong negotiation and also because it's, it's mandated by the Constitution. If we are to uh, undermine the Constitution right at the outset, what is there left to negotiate? And, and we don't ask the Taliban. There are several groups within the Taliban. There are several fractures and factions in the Taliban. We don't ask for them to, to be inclusive in that sense. It's the Taliban who want to negotiate. Um, who they sent to the negotiating table is up to them. You know, it's, it would be important for them to send in you know, strong negotiators. It's also important for us to send strong negotiators. We want to ensure. But at our end, we're representing a people. We're not representing an insurgency. And what we would like, what we want and, 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 uh, and are doing is to make this be mandated by the people. The Loe Jirga is hence a solution to that, to get the people to agree on what we can negotiate on. So, so they set the boundaries of how far we can actually go and what we are um, able to bring to the table. This is the consultative Loe Jirga, which I think right. was announced today that it has been rescheduled for April 26th? It has second. been scheduled. There was no reason. Oh, okay. I, originally, first there was time a, scheduled. a notional idea that it would be yes. earlier, but now it's, it's scheduled for... Uh, for April, April 29th. 20th, 29th, yes. Okay. Um, well, let me open this to uh, the audience now. Um, I don't have any particular ground rules. Well, let me... Actually, let me just... Handle it. Do you want to add anything? Is anything? No? Okay. Talk about the Security Council meeting today. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, and please, so please um, identify yourself, name, affiliation, if any. Uh, ask a question, uh, and then we'll answer. Please, sir, go ahead. And use the microphone. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. My name is Manik Mehta. I'm a syndicated journalist. Uh, you mentioned the port of Chabahar which is facilitating trade between Afghanistan and India. Uh, do you see potential to develop that route? Is, is it functioning well? And secondly, there was an attack on Afghanistan recently. Uh, you were supposed to take up this issue at the UN. What transpired after that? Which attack? You had a terrorist attack some time back, and there were reports that you were going to uh, take that issue at the UN. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as, as for the Chabahar route that was inaugurated last month by the president, um, that, that route is open. Um, it's, um, it, has, uh, it has already started functioning. And there are exceptions to using uh, Chabahar. Um, there are no sanctions exceptions for, from the United States. Uh, for Afghanistan, for shipment to India. Um, so it is an active route, and we, we do use it as, a, you know, as one of the alternatives for our uh, trade. And I'm not sure what, what this at attack is. We're, we're, we're often attacked by terrorists in Afghanistan. I'm not sure which attack you are and what we were supposed to raise to. Uh, but I would, um, I would say that, you know, Non-state actors, it's, it's a dangerous precedence to allow. I think a lot of countries think that because they're not hit by non-state actors, that it's not their problem. Letting this precedence be um, opens doors and opportunities for other groups to operate. 
if one of these groups was to, su to be successful, for whatever their objectives may be, um, it leaves a precedence for many of the others who are also part of that DNA. Right. So I, I wouldn't want to go too much into details, but I think those who would want to uh, look into that would understand. But I think together, sitting here in the UN, uh, sorry, in, in New York, where there is the United Nations, it's important that countries not view Afghanistan as an isolated case. Um, it, it's an issue that will that is uh, uh, that's shared. Yes, we are on the front lines now. We are taking the brunt of the, uh, uh, the 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 issue here and making the sacrifices. If we were to, if this was to end in Afghanistan and um, and, and not in the way that we would want it to be. Uh, and that is a clear defeat of non-state actors uh, and proxy groups. Um, this precedence could start to haunt other countries in our immediate neighborhood to begin with. Uh, yes. Hi, Diane Nissenbaum from the Wall Street Journal. Good to see you again. Uh, if I could just ask you a little bit more about your relationship with Zal and the and the those working on the peace process. You went to Abu Dhabi in December to try and play a role, and from what we understand, you were turned away by, by both sides. There's now a discussion about a full U.S. withdrawal in three to five years. Uh, you're signaling some warning about, about that. What, what would happen to the Afghan military and the government if the U.S. military were to withdraw in three to five years? And can you just tell a little, us a little bit more about what kind of interactions you're having with Zal as these processes un unrolling? Thank you. Well, um, first of all, I went to Abu Dhabi for a quadrilateral meeting. We have a mechanism with uh, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and the United States uh, where we meet uh, to discuss, again, uh, issues that are of mutual interest to all of us. We had a successful meeting, yet our negotiating team also came to Abu Dhabi around the same time because they also it was um, uh, followed by uh, uh, the first discussion between uh, the U.S. and Taliban, and which, which was facilitated by the Quad Group. Um, I wasn't personally there to negotiate. I'm not part of that team. But yes, our team came back without having um, had an opportunity to negotiate, uh, which was unfortunate. Uh, because I think um, the only way to peace is for direct talks. Um, as for um, uh, what would happen and what we are, um, as um, I, I think you know, uh, 2024 is the year that, um, that is part of the transformation decade where we would achieve self-reliance. Um, so it's still part of our roadmap. Um, if anything was to be implemented within that framework, it wouldn't make any difference. It wouldn't make an impact. Uh, and if there was any other timeline, it would, it would depend on what that timeline is. But we're prepared to have that discussion any day um, and, and, and prepare for whatever the consequences would be. What I'd say is if... Um, um, uh, if it comes down to it, we have all the preparation. Our security forces are preparing for what needs to be uh, to secure our uh, our uh, institutions and our people. Well, just to repeat something that you had said earlier, too, of course, that in a way what is most crucial is the financial support that enables mm. that their spirit to be to turn into something concrete. Correct. Right. You need fuel mm -hmm. as well as courage. Correct. Yes. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Donald Moore. Uh, one of the potential outcomes that I keep hearing about from the Doha talks is an idea of a caretaker government um, and that the current term of the current administration will end around June, I believe, and that one of the ideas is the caretaker government will take, 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 uh, take control and then elections would happen sometime afterwards. That, that might be one of the potential proposals that comes out. If that's the case, uh, that would require the administration to step down, have a caretaker government, whoever that would be, to take over. What would be the government's position on that? As far as we know, that is not part of the discussion. It has not 
been discussed at any point in any discussion. It has been repeatedly denied by those who are negotiating, and it's also denied by the Taliban. So, and multiple statements given by the Taliban for that, as well as the U.S., who have obviously told us that they, that's not part of the discussion and has not come up. We can talk a lot about uh, uh, poten you know, ifs. Since it's not, I, I would rather not. I would rather take our time and discuss something that is. Thank you. Uh, Yoshita Singh with Press Trust of India. I wanted to get your thoughts on India, Afghanistan. Uh, there'll be elections in both countries uh, this uh, summer. Uh, going forward, how do you see the co uh, cooperation on terrorism specifically evolving, uh, given that the hub of uh, terrorism is in uh, both uh, in Afghanistan and India's neighborhood? Thank you. Uh, I have restrictions on what I can say and shouldn't say, but I'm I'm glad to see that journalists are uh, are also under strict restrictions about what you are allowed to mention. Um, well, terrorism is a, a threat to all of us. We have a great relationship with India, of course. Um, we're both hurt by terrorism, and uh, we both suffer, so we understand what it uh, what uh, what the cost is that we're paying. Um, but it is not just a threat to India and Afghanistan. Uh, terrorism is is like cancer. It is it it is our problem today, but it will soon be someone else's problem once um, uh, once it's no longer ours. If it if we allow it, uh, but the Afghan people are committed and determined to make sure that we do not. Um, uh, we do not let it take us over in, in any in any aspect. And um, so we we continue to work with the region uh, to make sure that we have a common understanding. And it's not just with the region. I think um, one of the processes we have begun uh, with uh, with the United States as well is is to work on um, uh, on what potential hypotheticals would be for scenarios, different scenarios. And in that scenario, we want to have a clear uh, understanding of the threats, you know, mutually understandable threats on what are, because perspectives on the threats are different. Um, so we want to find a common um, uh, uh, picture of the, uh, of the threats that we face so that we can then work out a roadmap for how we're going to tackle it. Ask you if you could say a little more about that. What, do you, uh, if you can, you know, what are the main differences in threat perceptions that you see between Afghanistan and the United States? Well, uh, perceiving what what may be a threat to us um, and, and what uh, that that may not be uh, as the U.S. perceives it. Um, so areas that are perhaps we. Um, uh, Areas, militias, and others that may be operating, for example, uh, armed groups who are um, who are threatening uh, the security and stability of an area, um, may who may not come under these uh, f fancy names, but are still a threat. is is considered a threat to us, and so whereas the U.S. may not consider those um, uh, uh, armed groups as threats if they're not the Taliban or Daesh or, or one of the other recognized. So, they're, not connected you know, to, they're not connected to some form of international terrorism. Either that or if they're not recognized by, uh, by the State Department uh, as, um, uh, um, as terrorist groups. Uh, but we would, if they are um, uh, uh, hurting security and stability in an area in Afghanistan, we obviously put them under threat. So we're, we're, what we're working on is where, where our common threat assessment is. You know, there will always be a lot of overlap, but it doesn't mean that it will all be this, you know, the same. Um, you spoke a lot about... Um, I'm Lally Weymouth. Lally Weymouth. Um, you spoke a lot about how much progress women have made in your country, including your new ambassador. Um, as, as far as I can recall, the Taliban are no admirers of women. So um, 
I, how much la land do the Taliban actually control right now? And I, I just can't understand, even though you put it very politely, how in the world you would make, except for the fact they control half the land, you control X amount of the land. Um, you would make an uh, um, alliance with uh, the Taliban, unless I'm missing something. And how would the ladies feel about it? Who made the progress? Well, let me clarify. The Taliban only have issues with Afghan women. Well, that, They're that's fine not... to sit across American women and Russian women, and it's all absolutely fine. So that was fine, your, what you, you, know, you yeah. said. You said how much progress Afghan men yeah. made. So um, we're not prepared to go back on the achievements of, um, uh, of what we have made, you know, the freedoms the women have now. And it's not a progress that anyone has gifted to them, despite people would want to claiming that. They have earned all of what it has. Um, and I, um, I don't think we would want to go back. Uh, so it's, it's absolutely a red line. Um, um, on the part of um, how much um, areas the Taliban contest or control, um, on our assessment, we do it by population. Afghanistan is a very large country and sparsely populated. Uh, most of our population are in the, um, currently in the urban centers. Uh, all controlled by by the Afghan government. Uh, over 85 percent of this um, uh, the, the population live under uh, government control areas, uh, and in in everybody, even the other that are perhaps in contested areas, still um, uh, come to the government for services. The government still provide you know, run schools, uh, operate schools, hospitals, provide people that. Uh, in terms of area, like I said, it's a sparsely populated country. It's not, you cannot, um, uh, so as an example, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a village that's only about 200 people, one gunman can, can threaten security there, but does that mean that person controls? No, absolutely not. The government still provides, like I said, schools and ser other services. Those people still come to the government for um, for passports, ID cards, everything that comes through. So there isn't this myth about Taliban controlling areas. We still don't understand what control means. Terrorists threaten the United States cities here. They threaten um, uh, cities in Europe. Right, but but does it mean that... Well, the, the level of threats may be different. Right? We are under larger threat than you are. In this case, we are on the front line of this. You are not. Um, if if we were if we weren't at the front line, if we were to defeat, you may have to make deals with them too. So, uh, right now, I, I think um, uh, that's why that's what we mean by when we say Afghanistan is at the front line of terrorism at this point. I realize there's some questions. I'll get to you. I, I didn't realize there's some questions that are coming in uh, by electronic means, and people have been giving me cards that I didn't see. Okay, so someone named Michael asks via email if you could discuss your country's relationship with Iran. And let me just add to that, not just bilateral relations, but how uh, Afghanistan is affected by uh, the relations between Iran and the United States. We, we have um, agreed, and there is, um, uh, I, I don't think a written, but a gentleman's agreement that Afghanistan is an area of cooperation uh, for the United States and Iran and Russia. This is not an area where they would contest. Um, so we, are, we would like to keep it that way. Um, the issues between um, those countries are bilateral with the United States. Um, we... Um, w w uh, in our neighborhood, we like to maintain the relationships as um, as they are necessary for maintaining peace and stability. Yes. Hello. Um, I'm Sarwar, a Fulbright Scholar in Princeton. Uh, my question is about the implementation of the peace process. I think it's important to point out that the peace negotiations are currently happening at a time when discussion about withdrawal of U.S. forces uh, are, are being considered. Uh, we know that 50 percent of the peace agreements end up failing mainly in the implementation phase. If U.S. is withdrawing, and even if we assume an agreement gets signed, 
as a result of negotiations between the United States and the Taliban, in which it's also important to point out Afghanistan is not participating. So who exactly is going to implement this peace agreement? Is the United States going to withdraw or implement it? Is Afghanistan going to be responsible for implementing despite not being able to participate in the negotiation process. So what are the challenges to consider uh, as a result of, uh, as part of these uh, peace agreement when it comes to implementation? Thank you. It's more uh, to the American side, less, less to the Afghan. There is no peace agreement, let me say this, to, to clarify, there is no peace agreement at any point. Talks doesn't mean um, that we will reach an agreement right away. Whatever the process, peace is not going to be easy. It's, it's, it's fashionable to talk about peace right, at the, in, in the beginning, but when it gets down to the details, it is extremely difficult because everyone has to make compromises. Uh, and especially in our part of the world, compromises are extremely hard to make. So it's never going to be a straightforward process. There is going to be lots of ups and downs. We are committed to, uh, to that process, whatever it may be, and however uh, difficult it may be, because our people want peace. But what is peace is not really defined. Like I said, that's why we are holding the Loya Jirga. Uh, to understand what peace is to the Afghan people. Um, I will, uh, I'll give you a recent example of the women's jirga that was held. So the First Lady's Office consulted some 15,000 women across Afghanistan and all provinces and asked them questions about what it is that they uh, think peace should bring them. Um, oh, different people in different parts, based on their experiences, answered different questions. To some... Peace is justice, because they lost their loved ones to suicide attacks. Who is going to be answerable to that? What did they lose their lives for? Those who are fighting to protect our, uh, our, our sovereignty, our territorial integrity, and our people, what about in their, um, uh, their loved ones would want to see justice too? They would like to see why they were killed and what was the purpose of these people. If we... There are others who would like to see um, uh, peace at any cost. But again, to them, is peace just a ceasefire? You know, are they willing to close down their schools, uh, their girls' and, and women, girls school in their district or not? So we at this point don't really know what the price that the Afghan people are prepared to pay. Before that is, con um, uh, that is defined, I think it would be extremely difficult for anyone to say we are going to be able to reach a peace agreement because what do you agree upon? You turn to me, so if you don't mind, I'll make a short comment. Please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, first, when I was in the U.S. government trying to support peace process in Afghanistan, I did not find that peace was fashionable. Quite the contrary. Um, but uh, I think there's a misunderstanding about these talks. As I understand the official U.S. position, which may or may not be what happens in reality, these talks will not end up, even if they reach agreement, that's not the peace agreement. This is the end of one round, which then has, and whatever it may be agreed with the U.S. and the Taliban, will not be implemented until there are negotiations with the Afghan government about the future government of Afghanistan. And I should add, there also have to be negotiations with countries of the region about the system for cooperating in Afghanistan. So it's a much more, uh, I think the danger is not that an agreement between the US and Taliban will be implemented, but that certain people might just disregard diplomacy and make a unilateral decision about what they're going to do. Um, now, uh, yes, yes, cameraman. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Anshuman Apte from Voice of America. I have two quick questions for you. One about if you could spell out a roadmap that you and the Afghan government sees of its own involvement in the peace process. Uh, Dr. Ghani has announced uh, the peace jirga. Uh, Mr. Khalilzad has also said that Afghans need to unite to be able to uh, negotiate uh, at some stage. How do you see a roadmap for the Afghan government to get involved in this peace process? 
The second quick question is about regional dynamics. Often, you know, vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the latest, like the uh, recent terrorist attacks in India, uh, often peace in Afghanistan is played out as if it's some sort of like a byproduct of that rivalry between India and Pakistan. So how do you see the regional dynamics playing out in uh, achieving the lasting peace in Afghanistan? And also, if you could chalk out the roadmap, and has Mr. Khalilzad assured uh, that at XYZ stage, Afghan government will be involved? Well, f first of all, our roadmap for peace was announced at the um, Geneva conference uh, last year. Um, on Afghanistan, it is a very detailed roadmap, but just to give you a quick rundown of what would be the case is first to get a consensus on what peace is in Afghanistan, uh, announce based on that uh, a mandate from the people uh, and a team that the Afghan people would uh, agree upon um, and then have a consensus in the region on, on that Get the, getting an agreement from the region on what that piece is and, and consolidating those to be able to come up with the um, you know, agreement in the end to finalize. So we think that it, it, can, it, has, it can be done in this sequence, but of course other formulas may also be a, uh, applied to, uh, to achieve what they want. For us, the main point is a consensus on what the Afghans believe peace is and what the region would buy into. So has Mr. Khalilzad given any assurances all that participation yet that the Afghan government is desiring? Well, uh, Ambassador Khalilzad is a representative of the U.S. government. Um, he will do what is in the interest of the United States. Um, we, we will do what is in the interest of Afghanistan. For As far as our discussions with the United States, it is agreed that there is no agreement unless we have a full agreement. Right? Uh, so the Taliban can have many wish lists and what we would, they would like to see, but if that is not going to um, uh, be in, in line with what uh, the two governments who have a bilateral security agreement and a strategic partnership agreement um, have um, uh, agreed to, it would not be uh, it, 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 there would be no agreement with the with the Taliban on that hand. So, the discussions between the the United States and the Taliban are very narrowly focused on just the matters that are related to the United States and Taliban, which is the U.S. presence and terrorism, which the United States is interested in. Anything else would have to be discussed by the Afghan government and the Taliban. Uh, thank you. Um, now, I, we only have time for two more questions, and I'm going to rule that they both must come from women. So uh, uh, let, me, let, me take, let me take them together, and then you can respond. So let's see. Yes, thank you. Um, hello, uh, I'm Ranali, and I'm just an undergraduate student at Hunter College. Uh, my question, um, so you began your talk by talking about how Afghanistan's taking measures to ameliorate the status of women. And as we all know, we're in New York convening for the Commission on the Status of Women. So my question seemingly women-oriented. Um, you also spoke about how under your four-year plan, there have been overhauls with um, retirement of servicemen and operational changes. So my question was, what measures might the Afghanistan government take to increase um, contribution of uh, women in the security or defense sector? So, first of all, we um, yeah, women play a significant role in Afghanistan today. I have the um, ambassador and the deputy minister here who are here for exactly that purpose uh, at the UN. Um, uh, but overall, uh, the in uh, in Afghanistan in the last 18 years, um, the opportunities that the women have had for themselves and the um, uh, the space they have been able to carve for for themselves is um, uh, is quite significant. But it, there is also constitutionally mandated roles for women in in society. Uh, for example, in the parliament, there is a there is a specific number of women that can be in those seats cannot be taken away. So there has been some quotas to put in place 
uh, in the in the beginning, but that is not necessary. Well, it, it still is necessary in that sense. What we are able to uh, see women in leadership positions and senior management. Um, so they're not just um, representatives of uh, or or playing the role in in gender departments. Um, they're actually in charge of policy and um, uh, in governance in Afghanistan today. As for uh, for women, we've um, there is again um, quotas and mandates to include women in the security sector. Um, I would say we haven't always had success at finding the uh, the numbers that we wanted to match. Um, in the past, we had around 2,500 women uh, in the security sector, but in just the last two and a half months, since it's it coincides, we don't know if it's related, since the talks about peace have begun, some 1,200 women have registered into the Afghan security forces. So they, they wanted to enlist. We don't know if it's coincidental. Uh, it may or may not be, uh, but it seems like the um, uh, recruitment of women may rise uh, quite significantly, considering the trend we have seen over the past two and a half months. So, uh, one last question from a woman, please. Uh, Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll go there too. So I'll take both in sequence, and then we'll, you'll answer them both together. So please. Um, Misa Guthrie Mueller, I'm one of the uh, young patrons here at Asia Society. Um, would you mind speaking to the timeline and plans and implementation you have in place for reabsorbing and reassimilating some of the Afghan youth that have been caught up on the Taliban side? Hello, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my question is uh, a bit detail oriented. Do you identify yourself? Uh, Mariam. Uh, just Mariam. Um, my question is uh, related to the news that came out over this weekend. Um, the, there's a theory that Mullah Omar um, had been in Afghanistan all this time. Um, and it was this morning, it was, there's a statement from the Afghan government saying that that is incorrect. My question is both for you and also kind of for the media in the room to consider when there are these kind of reports, what is the role to fact check? And where does the position of the United States government's intelligence rely? And where the Afghan intelligence opinion is? Thank you. Well, not easy questions either. Uh, reintegration has been a big discussion uh, um, at the High Peace Council in Afghanistan uh, on what we do with Taliban combatants. In the, and that's perhaps what you're referring to. Uh, and where we where will we find be able to find room for them to reintegrate? Um, it, it's uh, there are several hypothetical plans um, or, or solutions, uh, none that we have actually um, agreed to at this point. They are all under consideration, uh, but they will be part of any peace negotiation if there were uh, when when it comes down to on how we integrate reintegrate. Uh, some of them, we can't say re because they they're, they may never have been any other, um, they may only have been in one place. So they will be part of any negotiating uh, or any agreement that we negotiate. Um, as for um, the news that, or, or the book uh, that makes some claims, um, we don't know the methodology of it, one. There are a lot of doubts about where, uh, how they managed to get the information. Um, it's also, since the Taliban are still in an active psychological warfare, uh, it, it plays right into their interest to be able to, uh, to give the kind of interviews they would want to. If they were asked questions, they would obviously want to play it into their psychological warfare game. Um, so the credibility of the information that has come and the methodology is still under review. But from what we have, what we have assessed so far, they're not credible. We will continue to make assessments on this part. As of um, what the U.S. does when something like this comes out, I cannot speak for the U.S. government. Well, 
I, I can't either, of course. But I, I, just one comment. Wherever Mullah Omar has been for the last few years, we know that all the other Taliban leaders have been in Pakistan. So uh, I, I think there's no real dispute about that. But uh, as I said, I can't speak for the U.S. government. But I believe I could speak for the people in this room. And thanking you very much for such a lively and frank and informative discussion. And we look Thank forward you. to having you back again and also in extending our welcome to new permanent representative, Ambassador Adela Raz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.